April 2002, Billy Thorpe, Michael Chugg and Kevin Jacobson embarked on producing a landmark in Australian music. Long Way to the Top, The Arena Show, brought 35 of Australia's rock and pop icons together for a national tour of 14 shows playing to 140,000 people. You've seen the live show and the DVD, and now it's time to get up close and personal to see what went on behind the scenes as the rock legends hit the road together for the first time, and maybe even the last. It all began when Billy Thorpe was chatting to longtime friend and Australian promoting legend Michael Chugg about the possibility of doing a live version of the hugely successful Long Way to the Top TV series. It was quite funny. I was going through customs and the guy checking my passport said to me, oh, you were fantastic on Long Way to the Top. I said, what are you talking about? He said, oh, Long Way to the Top, the history of Australian rock and roll. Your, your interview was just funny when you talked about Billy killed the fish. And that happened everywhere I went for the next four or five days. I started to get this feeling of, of excitement from the press and people I talked to a lot, or I have talked to with my, you know, when I've been promoting books and records and stuff like that, that there was something going on. And I went to Michael again, I said, this is, I think this is the opportunity. So one night Thorpe and I were out and when we get together, we have a few drinks and a few laughs and um, the idea came up, why don't we take it on the road? I said to him, you know, what do you think it would take to do this if, you, if we did it Rolls-Royce? Because I, I said, the only way to do this, if it's possible to do it, would be to do it like an international uh, tour. And then the reality set in the next day, and that reality lasted for about four months. It was like, oh, will this work? Can we pull this off? Is this feasible? Will anybody want to go? Um, and then one morning, um, I rang Billy and said, yeah, look, I think we'll have a go at this. The first thing I did was rang Kevin Jacobson and Amber Jacobson and said, do you want to be in this? Because I felt that their input was important because let's face it, Kevin and Cole had been there right from the start. And I also, you know, figured a lot of the acts that we wanted to use would be out of the Jacobson stable. So Kevin, of course, they loved the idea. Um, and basically away we went. Rock and roll and you're still doing it now. All right. With the Jacobsons on board with Michael Chugg, it was the joining together of two of the biggest promoters and producers in Australia. The long way to the top tour had taken its first step into Australian music history. I sort of heard uh, through the grapevine there was something happening. Uh, when I was first asked to, to do it, uh, I really didn't know what it, what it really involved, you know, and I went, oh, yeah, that sounds good, a tour. And then all of a sudden I talked to Max Merritt and, and um, he kind of filled me in on what was happening and everything. I went, wow, this is going to be a good show. I've got to do this. I was actually in Adelaide and Michael Chug rang me on my mobile. And uh, just sort of threw the idea, and I said, I'll get back to you in five minutes, I'll rang Matt. And <laughs> that was sort of it, wasn't it? Yeah, five minutes later, we were on. <laughs> We'd been doing different shows together in twos and threes, fours sometimes, but never anything of this magnitude. So, you know, when Chuggy rang and he said, you're not going to believe it, but it's going to be 30, you know, 400 acts and 74 hours. And it just seemed like it was possible. When they started reeling off the names and how many people are going to be on it, I just wondered how they're going to actually put it together. And, um, but well, I just thought that was going to be great. You know, it was just well, great to be a part of it, just, you know, and see like a history thing before your eyes. You're seeing uh, a lot of Australian, the history of Australian rock. It, it's a wonderful tour in that respect, in every way, from Chuggy down. I mean, Chuggy's in this business because he's a fan. The Jacobsons are in it because they're fans. They loved the music. They were in the music and still are, you know, and that's the difference between the true impresarios in that respect. So it's a pleasure to be on this tour. I mean, it was Michael himself who called me in January and said, do you want to sing Cheetah Blood again? And that's when I said, I've never stopped singing it. Of course I will. When is it? And he said, well, we're looking later in the year, about August. I said, count me in, I'd love to do it. 
I probably would have been very disappointed if I hadn't have been asked because um, I think I feel as if I'm the grand dame here. I'm certainly the oldest out of all the girls. Mind you, there's only four. But uh, I was extremely happy because uh, being part of the industry so early and also knowing it was going to give me the opportunity to meet all the other kids that sort of grew up in, in the 70s and songs that I really enjoyed, uh, it was a, such a buzz for me. It was first leaked to me by Jim Keyes from the Masters. He said, Michael Chug rang me up and mentioned about doing The Long Way to the Top as a tour. And I thought, yeah, it'd be fun to do, but gee, will anyone want to go and see it? I thought, maybe it'll do one show in each major city. I don't think I was totally wrapped and I, I didn't really think it was going to work, you know, to be honest, but, uh, you know, it has. It's fantastic. You know, once in a lifetime chance to do something with all these people that I, I admire and love working with over the years. I really enjoyed the series and, and uh, I thought it'd be a great chance to see people that I haven't seen for 30 odd years. Uh, Cole Joy and Johnny Akip, all those people that were, when I was a kid, they were my, my heroes. It's just a lot of fun, it's what I grew up doing. Um, and it's, it's great to be along and see a lot of the people that I haven't, some of them I didn't even, I've never had the pleasure of working with. Looking forward to working with um, all the Aussie greats, you know, which they are through the, through the ages. And um, hey, I think we're going to have a good time and I think we're going to make a bit of history here, which, which is good for Aussie music, you know, through the ages. do a show that went from the 50s to 2000 because we wouldn't have been able to give it enough of each era. So we decided we'd do 50s, 60s and through to the mid 70s. We decided early on that we were going to try and do it as, as faithful as we could and keep some sort of a flow and a vibe as faithful as we could to the chronological order of the thing. Which had to be shifted around a little bit because you can't have three female acts back to back. You can't have, you know, um, um, acts doing the same kind of material going back to back. But by and large, it was pretty close to chronological. Yeah, uh, you looked at the 50s and you went, OK, we need Cold Joy. We need uh, Judy Stone. We definitely need Little Patty. Uh, we looked at uh, certain male vocalists of the time and uh, we ended up uh, with Lucky Star, who became like, Lucky's two and a half minutes on stage. It was a highlight every night. Doing I've Been Everywhere, man, was just incredible. Uh, Lonnie Lee, who was great value to the show, and Dinah Lee, who was, for me, was one of the stars of the show every night. And, and you know, it, and it was very, we had to sort of, you know, to make it work, you had to start. Cole had to be the opening act. Please give a big welcome to the stage to the legendary Cole Joy. And who else could open? I mean, who, you know, who, Cole is the godfather of the Australian rock and roll business. That's it. Just no, there's no question about it. I mean, there was the, the joint kings were were Jock and Cole who fought like cats and dogs to maintain <laughs> to maintain the crown. But Cole is the surviving king. He's, uh, and when he went out there every night and, uh, and opened it, everybody knew. Everybody knew what sort of a, you know, oh, shit, if Cole Joy's opening the show, it must be a hell of a show, you know. And it was perfect. It just opened with Cole, who's such a great entertainer, and it just went. By the end of Cole's few minutes, he had the audience in his hand, and it just flowed through the rest of it. So the 50s came together pretty easily. Um, the 60s, you had to look at the original Aztecs. Um, you had to look at Glenn Shorrock and Brian Cadd with so many of the great 60s bands like Axiom, The Twilights, Brian's own solo stuff. So you had to look at that. Um, Masters Apprentices were obviously had to be in there somewhere. 
uh, late 60s into the 70s, um, Spectrum, I'll Be Gone, which is one of the classic all-time songs. That had to be in there somehow. Uh, the Chain, who were the first uh, band in the late 60s, very early 70s, to break through on commercial radio with a song called Black and Blue, had to be in there. Um, Ross Wilson, in some form of Daddy Cool, had to be in there. Max Merritt came on board, Russell Morris came on board, Normie Rowe, who I'd been a big fan of, came on board, and Normie obviously was one of the stars of the show. Um, and then obviously you looked at the 70s and you, know, you had to have John Paul Young and the All-Stars, um, uh, Kevin Burridge, the Lardy Gars, that great song, Gonna See My Baby Night. I mean, the songs picked the acts as much as the acts, we picked the acts. Then Michael uh, said, I, you know, I've got, we need to get somebody on board to run this thing, to really get this thing together, because, you know, from, from this end. So um, I rang up Amanda Pillman, who I'd met uh, years and years ago when she was working with Mushroom Records and she'd been involved in theatre, she'd, you know, been involved in a lot of the major plays with IMG and Harry Miller and people like that. So Amanda came on board and uh, Billy, Amanda and I um, basically became the producers of the show. And um, we started work. With all systems go, the production went into full swing. The marketing team began to sift through hundreds of archival photos supplied by the acts and fans to be used for the posters, flyers and newspaper ads. Hours of vintage footage was searched through to find just the right vision for the TV commercials and the live show multimedia production time, packages. And long way to the top invited special guests to share memories of their youth, the and music the and their idols. Mr Stevie Rhymes! Meanwhile, as the bands reunite and begin to rehearse at the ABC studios in Sydney, the reformation of Billy Thorpe's original Aztecs after 30 years was one of the true highlights for the show. I'd avoided putting the original Aztecs back together because I really didn't want to dwell too much on the 60s stuff. I thought it was too hard to pull off and the, we were all that much older and the band wasn't a playing band and people like Tony hadn't played uh, live in years. and. Um, but we got back together at my studio um, and Current Affair filmed it. The very first notes we played actually were on camera. And it was like uh, we'd just done a gig at Surf City the night before. It was uh, unbelievable. And uh, like I said, if I'd have known we were that good, I wouldn't have, we wouldn't have broken up, you know. It sounded exactly like the 60s. Uh, we all looked, you know, 40 years older, but it was... Um, it was an amazingly vibrant sound, and I saw the audience's reaction to it when, when the uh, stage spun around, and uh, we came out in our original suits, or you know, cop reasonable copies of our original suits, uh, sounding pretty much like we did 40 years ago. It was a great experience. We really felt we needed um, Stevie Wright, because of the big effect, obviously, the Easy Beats had on Australian music. And also, later on, uh, Stevie, uh, as a solo act, when he had that 10 minute hit Evie and Hard Road, which the year they came out, they were, in the, they were number one for something like 15, 20 weeks. So we, we, Billy and I flew Stevie up. We talked to Stevie and told him the idea, and um, Stevie was very excited about it. Uh, Anyway, we said, OK, well, we'll get you up again next week and we'll get you in the studio with uh, Pig Morgan, who uh, was in the All-Star Band. Uh, I work with um, Stevie and the All-Star Band again at the studio, because Stevie hadn't worked in five or ten years. He hadn't sung in those ten years. You know, he was understandably nervous. While the Sydney-based artists were rehearsing, other performers and musicians were assembling in almost every other capital city around Australia. We've got all the acts together. We then start working on what songs they're going to sing. And obviously with some of the acts, uh, if you had them sing every hit they had, they'd be on stage for half an hour. And really we worked out we had to get this show into like a three hour situation, you know, a normal 
a theatre show or a concert it usually starts at 8 o'clock and finishes at 11. So we started to work through the songs and Amanda and Billy and I spent countless hours arguing over the songs and chopping the songs and trying to work out how long it was going to take. And Basically then we decided we needed a director. So Amanda suggested Ted Robinson who I knew through uh, his days at Double J and uh, uh, all his very successful work in ABC television, Billy was aware of Ted, so we had a meeting with Ted and we basically brought Ted and uh, his crew on. So he can be like preset here, yeah. da -da 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 -da, flash, flash, yeah. flash, bang, yeah. in the pool of light. Yeah. Okay. And then start a song. Okay. We can sort everything else later. I just wanted to know that much before I start talking to Cole. Yeah. You're happy here? That's yeah. where we we'll Yeah. Okay. We needed to put a crew together that A, were probably the best in the world at their jobs, and B, had so much passion for Australian music. And so for me, I was able um, to go to Eric Robinson, who was who runs Jans, head of production, and, and was was right there in the early late sixties, early seventies when I started running concerts. So to bring Eric on board to put all the production together, and then I was able to go out and get Sneaky Pete McPhee, who had worked with Jimmy Barnes, and uh, we actually stole him off in excess. Um, Scrooge Madigan, who is the legend, legendary roadie, was one of the first roadies. He from, was from Melbourne um, and was worked with Daddy Cool and uh, to bring him back into the mix. And uh, uh, Wayne Swampy Jarvis, who had been the original Lardy Das roadie and had gone on to be a very successful tour and production manager, to be able to bring him on board, go out and get the best guitar techs, drum roadies, and the riggers. And, it was incredible that we were able to assemble it. When we worked out when we were going to do the tour, based on getting the acts available, there was, it was as much getting the right crew available. As the first of the 20 semi-trailers are filled with tonnes of sound, lighting and staging equipment needed to produce the show for the next 40 days on the road, the long way to the top haul across the Nullarbor to Perth begins. For scheduling and logistic reasons, the full show rehearsals and first show would take place in Perth at the Burswood Dome. The Dome is unlike any other venue the tour would be presented in. A large arena created more for sporting events than rock concerts, the massive translucent roof area is not supported by tons of steel like other venues, but by air. The stadium is essentially a large pressurised balloon. So for the road crew on their first setup, rather than hanging the tons of lights and speakers from the roof as they would everywhere else, the only way is from the ground up. It was definitely a long way to the top. Apart from the road crew's extra setup for the venue, the daylight conditions inside the arena created problems for the lighting crew, having to create complex and spectacular lighting effects in broad daylight, or work throughout the night to get it done. So we all went to Perth, to the Birdswood Dome, which isn't the greatest venue in the world, I've got to tell you. It's a, it's a concrete structure with a blow-up roof made out of parachutes, basically. Um, every time you open the door, the roof sinks. Uh, if you open the wrong door, you get blown up the fucking corridor. I mean, it's just a disaster. For the artists, the unique venue involved entering and exiting the backstage area through two airlocks, more akin to a space station than the small concert halls they'd played in over 30 years ago. We were out halfway out the door lock, and, and <laughs> oh, Ray Columbus opened the other oh, door, you, yeah. and it almost sucked his handle hole. Oh, you were there? Of course you were. Yeah. Oh, yes. What about that, really? I mean, it's scary, isn't it? Well, I'm, ple I'm pleased that we experienced it. See the swells out on the ocean now, moving in a I really didn't get to um, appreciate it as an artist because I was privy to everything that went on from day one. Um, you know, the stage designs, the dance, every element of this I, you know, I pretty much had a hand in, in the decision making process. Uh, unlike all the other artists who uh, uh, arrived in Perth and it, it, it sort of um, uh, hit them as artists, 
Uh, when I arrived in Perth, I went there as a producer, although I was still doing the show that night. But when I walked into the into the, the dome in Perth and saw the set, I just turned back into a 16-year-old kid again. It was like, wow, you know, we're going to have any how many weeks on the road with this? You know, it was really, really exciting. It became a reality then and there for me. I mean, I'd seen the scaffolding of the staging. We talked about what could go on there and inflatables and all the things that were going to happen and didn't and all some of the great things that, that came up last minute and uh, but walking into the into the the gig in Perth where we rehearsed for the week prior to the show it really became the penny drop for me uh, seeing that set and it also the penny drop for everybody else uh, a lot of the people that sort of had doubts about uh, where what the show was all about and there were a few of the artists I think that were still thinking oh Jesus I don't know if I've done the right thing the second they saw that set, they realised, you know. Billy was saying, this is an event... It is an event, yeah. ..that will be talked about for many years to come. And something that should have happened before. And we're just saying how good it is to be part of it now. With the long way to the top, I think it's uh, people really want to... just not just go out and see something, you know, one night. They want to have an event. This show's about memories, and for baby boomers, uh, a friend of mine's got 18 of his staff came to the show, and he's a Canadian tonight, including his daughter, who's like 13. Um, they're coming because they love music, and they love the history of Australian music, and they're here because it's about memories, and everybody remembers with that song, something happened. I think that's one of the great things about this, is the fact that the general public now has got an idea where it all fitted in, and how it fitted in, and, and, and that we have got a rich history of, of, of great music in this country that hasn't really been um, um, shown before, and, and this, is a, this is a great base for, 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 for the whole, um, for a whole awareness of, of what it was all about. And it's great that so many artists have been able to be collected together on one show. I'm just sorry that it didn't start 10 years ago and, or 10, 20, 30 years ago to try and pick up the people that have gone uh, before us and, and so we'll have a true documentary of the, of the history of Australian music because it's certainly come a long way since I first started off. It's not just all the bands that are coming together for the first time in a long time but all these road crew and production people so the vibe was amazing. I've got to do my work as well, I'm not stopping for everybody. Well, I need you to stop so we get the show up, otherwise we won't start it too, because nothing's happening on the stage. Fine, well then when we put the band up, I'll just make some more noise. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do a sound check with an untuned PA. The responsibility for the organised chaos of building the stage, lights and sound system falls at the feet of one man, veteran technical director Eric Robinson, feared and loved by all. Eric's been involved in almost every large show to tour Australia since the early 70s. No one's been whinging or pissing when they've been into it, so it's a lot of stage. The road crew have enormous experience in staging a show of this size. However, it's the logistics of getting 35 acts with different equipment on and off stage that's playing havoc with the crew. Long Way to the Top has 54 guitars, 9 drum kits and 60 musicians. We're running 16 Marshall quad boxes, mainly for the use in the finale for Billy Thorpe. We've got uh, four uh, Fender Twins, six AC30s, we've got uh, five Ampeg 810 cabinets. We've basically got half a 40-foot semi-trailer of backline. I look after 54 guitars. Uh, to tune, it's taking now about 45 minutes to get right through. Number 33. And then I go back and do them all over again, and then I retune them as they come off the stage, so that uh, I can read the guitar and how it's moved, how the tunings have moved as on stage as to off stage, and then compensate for it. Done. The number of acts in the in the small amount of time we've got to turn around uh, obviously involves a, a fair few compromises, and just trying to keep everybody as happy as we possibly can. Obviously, you've got four to 30 acts on stage, you've got lots of fast changes, you've got lots of people to work with. Um, luckily, a lot of them are very experienced in doing their things. People have their moments, but most of the time on this tour, there's a lot of friends on this one, so uh, it's not so bad. We don't have to deal with English or Americans. Our biggest problem for a tour like this is learning 30 different acts two days before we hit the road. 
the venues that have been the biggest problem, like Wollongong and Canberra and Newcastle, that just aren't designed for a show this big. At the end of the day, you make it work, you know what I mean? You make it, you make it look pretty, you make it work, and you fix the problems along the way. I've always been slightly concerned where it was appropriate for the Atlantics to do this thing because um, they're slightly different. This one, the era of dance, of rock groups actually in terms of where they'd be working with go-go dancers and they, yeah, they might have been but, um, but uh, I also understood that it was a great kind of tempo and quarry yeah, yeah. potential there so yeah, I knew yeah. that's why you were immediately attracted to it. Oh yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I, I quite like the idea of them running up there and doing this trip on the this stairs. I think that'll look terrific. Yeah. Um, there's an issue of whether we go up the top and start it and come down at some point or stay up there for the whole thing or and I don't know the answer to that yet. So I might be down because I think every other routine I do I'm going down. I think because the Atlantics is sort of big there, I like that it bookends it. That's just in my head. As any artist from the 50s, 60s and 70s will tell you, the one thing that hasn't changed over the last 30 years is the dancing girls. And for long way to the top, choreographer William Forsyth faithfully recreated the Maroubra Stomp the 60s go-go dancer moves and the 70s showgirl routines happening in and around the multi-tiered stage, adding to the authentic feel of the show. For the dancers, who are usually found performing in any number of musicals around Australia, the opportunity to travel with the veteran rock stars on the massive tour and perform the dances of yesteryear earned them a newfound respect for the ones who'd been before them. It was all a bit of a laugh to start off with because you think go-go dancing, oh, it's easy, bit of jiving, bit of Austin Powers, but we have got so fit during 60s yes. dancing, you get the most amazing stomach muscles. So we all look fabulous <laughs> now in our feather steps. We have a lot of respect for 60s go-go yes. girls. So while the dancers were rehearsing side stage, the house band, under the guidance of musical director Jamie Rigg, are rehearsing the 27 songs they'd be playing for the seven solo artists. You know, we, uh, the perfectionists that we are, we, you know, th this show will be a better show, three or four shows down the track, and that you could say that about anything you do these days because the amount of music that we have to cram into a period of putting this together, there's so many things that everyone has to think about. We're not just thinking about the music, we're thinking about where we should be at any particular time, who's on next, what happens here, where should I be? Uh, when that all becomes second nature, then you can sit back and you can relax on the music a whole lot more and just play it as you want to play it. The backing singers were three of the hardest workers on the long way to the top tour. Shauna, Adrian and Robin would be singing 37 of the 53 songs, more than any of the acts on the show. These three talented singers have been rehearsing off CD for the past month and they're now learning the sometimes very different live versions. They're finding the intense rehearsal schedule very draining and with the show order constantly changing as the creative team continue to fine-tune the running order and song list, they're struggling to keep up. With a tour like this, you're, you're given the repertoire and sent away to learn it, and then you go into rehearsal and you, you learn the, the, the arrangement and, you know, hopefully remember it all. Didn't we have this in unison, this one? Well, there again, it's written in unison, but on the record, it's just... Okay, let's do it. The workload was far greater than we originally anticipated and so we, it was quite a stressful time for us. Because when I got then really confused when I was listening to the CD because I was doing it incorrect, I think, and you were doing it, and I... I, I was listening to the... I was so glad and I couldn't... It was really a bad mix. To learn you know, 37 songs out of a 53-song yeah. show in a very short space of time was extremely difficult. And then when you learnt those songs, they added uh, another yes, five. Yes, that's and right. And those, they added another five. Yeah. Cheese and mods, okay? Yep, easy. Um, yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sweet. Uh, that's okay. It's just the case or us or la just want to check those parts there. Since it was in, it was out. It was in, it was out. But that was all right. It's always it's all part of it. You know, you just get in there and do do the best <clears throat> you can. That's right.
We're wondering when the tour is going to start. It feels like we've been here for a week, you know? Hello, mate. You ready? Let's go. Come on, so while we're still young. Okay. A show that'll be four hours long in its finished form takes way more than four hours to rehearse. And as the creative team, headed by Ted Robinson, Amanda Pellman and Billy Thorpe, are working on getting it just right, it's taking a lot longer than expected. Even with the well-planned rehearsal period in full swing, the sheer volume of songs combined with technical stage changes are blowing the timing of the show. Two days out from the first show, the running time is a staggering five hours. And the long rehearsal times and countless meetings are taking their toll on everyone. That was two minutes and 30 seconds of fucking nothing. After the first rehearsal, we were a bit worried that the show was going to be too long. So we rehearsed part two and obviously the show was pa panning out to about four, a bit over four hours. So basically we had to knock, two days before the first show, we virtually had to knock, I don't know, 16 songs out of the show. I'm telling you, you this is fucking Bill, bullshit. We've got a major, major 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 Difficult decisions need to be made to cut down the running time of the show. Cutting songs is the only way to make the show fit the scheduled running time. The question is, which artists cut which songs? And more importantly, who's going to tell them? Fucking boring. We can make this work, OK? We can make this fucking work, OK? And the way we make it work is a double setup on the front stage. Look, 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 look. look. JPY, knees 240, love 3 and music 350. Too long to cut. I'm serious. It's axe time, guys. All of this nicety has got to go. I'm in the museum and I'm trying not to do it, but you've got to do it. You've got to lose your song. You've got to lose your song. So, you know, nobody knows what I'm talking about. Well, it's a question of talking those three acts and saying you're going to have to share a kit, you're going to have to the amps, you're going to have to do this and that. And it saves... two of them play harmonica. It's hardly a big deal there. So, of course, I copped that job. So I had to go around and tell all these acts that, look, you can't do that. You can't do, normally I'm sorry, you can't do it, ain't necessarily so. Billy, you can't do them in the sick and tired. Uh, Russell, you're going to have to cut Wings of an Eagle um, uh, or uh, one of your other songs or you're going to have to put them together. So, I mean, there was a fair bit of emotion, you know, having to get people to drop songs. And of course I became known as the toe cutter. During the long days and nights, the crew take a second to remember the birthday of the man charged with the creative look of the show, Ted Robinson. Although, there's no time to eat the cake. No speech, we haven't got time, we're far too late. <laughs> Let's move on. She wrote to me from Texas all the acts on Long Way to the Top, they've not played together in 25 years. So the emotions were running high as they took the stage. And the question was, how were the nerves? You, you sort of kid yourself that you're not phased, but, you know, when it comes down to it and it's 20 minutes to go, yeah, you get, you get rattled. My oath. Yeah. No, I can't afford to be. And it's very hard to say, tell them I'll sing more Liz Mamalula Bar when you've got a dry mouth. <laughs> I'll be OK. <laughs> I, I, I love getting hit by nerves. And uh, it, it just gives you that extra um, dose that you need. There's always hiccups. There'll be hiccups. That's rock and roll. It's just as long as the hiccups happen to someone else, not me. <laughs> um, I th yeah, it, 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 just sitting out there watching the rehearsal is, is, gets the adrenaline going. And I think that tomorrow night or whenever the opening night is, it's just going to be so fantastic. It's been phenomenal and, and everyone's sort of uh, 
pretty excited about it. We still haven't sort of nailed some of the little things, the little technicalities down yet. It's very hard to get all these acts on for two songs or three songs and then get them off as quick as possible. When you start rehearsals, it seems impossible it'll ever come together. It just seems like there's too many variables and too many things not happening. And then gradually it tightens and tightens and then the last rehearsal is really, the, well, the last run through is the one where you can judge how fantastic it's really going to be. And it's a buzz before every show. I don't think you ever get used to that. Maybe that's the right way to be healthily nervous. Good evening, Perth! Michael Chug, Kevin Jacobson and Jack Utick welcome you to the Australian concert event of the new millennium. Fasten your seatbelts for a long way to the top! All the performers settle into what they do best, and that is rock the house. Bye, From bye, Cold bye. Joy to Dinah Lee, Billy Thorpe to Marsha Hines. All the acts bring back the memories with hit after hit after hit. Although someone neglected to tell the security guards who was really in charge. Ladies and gentlemen, Billy Thorpe. This is my fucking show, let them dance. All right. One of the very special moments of the show that would go on to be an important part was when Long Way to the Top cast members came on stage to support Stevie Wright during the epic Evie parts one, two and three. That song, Evie, uh, when you take the lyrics out of the context they were written in, just fits Stevie. And it was very emotional. And um, I, I think, I, I don't know that I had the idea, I, I just think we all rallied and said, come on, let's go out, he, he, let's just go out and do something. Let's, let's show our solidarity that first night for Stevie when we went and sat on the stairs. And there was, I mean, the, the, I'm looking at the crowd, they're all crying, we're all crying. All the, uh, here's all the hard-ass roadies that were down the side of the stage. They're all, they go, ooh. All the acts are crying that are on the show. Amanda's crying. Chuggy's in tears, you know. I mean, it was a real, it was, to me, it was the moment in the show that defined the show. It defined what the whole thing was all about, about respect. Well, I'm losing you. So fucking inspired and do a cartwheel. <laughs> Have you been missing being up on stage? I didn't think so, but when I got up there, yeah, certainly I have. Uh, it's a different world. Excellent. The crowd really it's a lovely it. world. Yeah. Fantastic. Well done. Oh, great. Thanks, crowd. Thanks, crowd. As artists are reunited on the tour, they're reminiscing about old times and about how much has and hasn't changed. We used to tour around, pack all the gear in a combi van with the band and travel around. Now you need a, a couple of semi-trailers semi to, to carry everything around in the gear and, uh, and, and plus uh, nowadays we don't have the groupies that we used to, you know. No, it's, it is very different. That's why I went solo actually, because I couldn't stand the fact of being in a band and travelling in a combi and sleep laying on top of the equipment because we couldn't all fit in. And putting mattresses on top of the equipment, I just couldn't stand it and I thought we're going to get killed. 
and I, we were earning nothing. I thought, I'm going to go solo, I can't stand it. So, yeah, yeah, combi uh, van, transit vans. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, piling in on top of all the equipment, um, you don't miss that at all then? <laughs> no, of course we do. Of course. <laughs> we love it. You know, it was great fun. We were young and we uh, we just had a great time. I, you know, we did five shows one one night in, in, Melbourne. in Melbourne. You know, five shows is a lot, you know. Five spots, yeah. Five spots and you, you, you carry the PA, PA in yourself and set it up. Everybody's out front watching you do that, you know, and then you come on and do your shows. I like the way we used to travel when things were smaller, you know, the smaller PA systems. We could all fit into a combi perhaps, you know, the band and the singers and the roadie, everything. But of course that's changed and it's huge now. It has advantages and disadvantages. But to perform in a big entertainment centre, not many of us do that in our lives uh, very often. Um, I suppose I've done it a fair few times. And it is, it is a buzz. That's the only word I can think of. You never, you never get blasé about it or you never take it for granted. It, it really is a thrill. We certainly did our, our apprenticeship with touring in the early years. Uh, and this is much easier to be on this kind of on the road again. Because when we started, we had a, a, a car or a utility with a box trailer behind it. And it'd be nothing to do a show and then drive four or five hundred mile and do another show the next night. They don't do that. I mean, you fly and, you, and a lot of people look after you. So it's much easier now than it used to be. Um, so this becomes almost like a, a holiday. Oh no, it's definitely got easier. I mean, we have monitors and everything now. We didn't have, <coughs> excuse me, we didn't have monitors until the 70s, really. But, but there was something rather pure about the transit van days. Um, in retrospect, I don't know whether I'd even be able to listen to a recording of those days, what we must have sounded like live. It must have been horrendous. But, but in a lot of ways, even though things are better and bigger and shinier and newer and cleverer, the reality is that you've still got to play together and you've still got to play those songs. And the playing and those songs still have to reach out and touch an audience. The technology around us today, we're sharing for the first time. I mean, 30 years ago, we had nothing like this. No, and there was no pole back, hadn't been invented, or front of house, no. or never even heard of it. No. It good. We'd never played at this level before, like uh, in the 60s, like this, this massive production fallback. I mean, in the 60s, we didn't have fallback, did we? No. That's didn't right. know what it was, you know? Well, nobody had fallback, you know? Fallback is a, a euphemism for, mo uh, for on stage monitors. Um, they're they're the, the speakers that uh, you're seeing less and less of them now because more of them are being flown up in the air above the stage in big concerts. But they're those wedges uh, for, for anybody that's watching this that's not sure that you see on stage it, it, that allow the artists to be able to hear themselves. The technology is unbelievable. I mean, we, we, you know, we didn't work with any of that stuff. And, and, um, and I think that's what Doug was sort of saying too, is that um, you, you sort of can't play the songs the way they were because of the technology. You've got to play them better in a way because you can hear them. You know, you can hear everything now. Um, whereas back then it was just a complete dog's breakfast every time we played. We would have screaming fans out the front, a loud band back in the back, usually our own bands, the Invaders or whoever, or in that case the Hermits, and um, you couldn't hear yourself sing. There was no fallback technology then. It didn't come until about 69. So, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd talking was the worst thing after singing, but uh, to do two shows a night without that facility. So it's a pleasure now to do the show because um, and that's why I've kept singing all these years. It, once Foldback came in, it became a real joy to keep singing. I can see why the Beatles stopped cheering. They couldn't hear themselves. They couldn't enjoy what they were doing. And they stopped just before Foldback came in. The national tour played Perth, Adelaide, Brisbane, Canberra, Wollongong, Sydney, Newcastle and Melbourne. With 60 performers on the road, keeping them organised and where they need to be and when they need to be there is the job of the tour manager. And Long Way to the Top needed three of them. That job entails most of the time uh, making sure that they get on the bus when they're supposed to, get into their hotel rooms when they're supposed to, get into the venue when they're supposed to, and get on the stage when they're required. We have to get a cab and we're going to have to put the rest in the cab. So, we've run out of fucking baggage room. But just as important was keeping track of the 500 pieces of luggage that went on and off the plane 
as the show rolled across Australia. Can you imagine we're doing 500 laminates on the smallest laminating machine in the history of the world? It's the highs and the highs of my career. As the tour finds its rhythm, friendships and friendly competition grow between the acts and crew, with a little push-along from legendary roadie Scrooge Madigan. What it is, is there's a way of uh, playing with their minds because we have no other way of getting to them. So we play with their minds, you see. We give them points and stuff. Even Wheatley got one. Look, he got one for attendance is compulsory. He keeps throwing in the substitute. Uh, Burgess and I were equal last on this thing. And I remember uh, it was a classic because this it went up and, you know, some people were way down the bottom, people that other people were way up the top. And a few of the acts started to take it a bit seriously. You could see them sort of glancing at it, you know every night wondering what you know why uh, why the drummer from um, from Tamam Shad had uh, you know 500 points and Normie Roney had 35 you know I often we spoke about I often this project know. about two weeks ago for the first two weeks absolutely no one was interested absolutely no one and they just went over the top of the head but as soon as this thing went up in Brisbane the other night the amount of people that come to us and said to us where's my name I'm not I've only got 40 uh, they've so they've taken it so seriously it's fantastic light entertainment to make people um, uh, proud of the fact that we work with them but more importantly to lift their game. It's amazing how a little graph goes a long way because I went from with equal uh, last I think we were on 210 points to 10,000 overnight uh, Aztec t-shirts for the crew, mate. Eh? <laughs> but have you seen this? No, Thorpey. No, How did he get up? Yeah. 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 It's just proof right. positive yeah. that there is, you can achieve in this right. business. Absolutely. Absolutely. From corruption. 8 to 486, corruption goes a long way, as Absolutely. you taught me as a young lad. Bit of graft. <laughs> 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 did you get your fucking dinner? We got your t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, it's got nothing to do with musical ability. No, no. no, no. Well, well I, knew, I knew because Billy had nothing yeah. to do with musical yeah, ability. Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 with Colin Burgess, that proves the point. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but now he's up the elephant. Well, evidently, there's something for life. Yeah, the looking for me? Yeah. <laughs> the king. He's the king. He's the champion. Yeah. Funny like that, uh, Billy. He always comes up and offers you something that you've really wanted all your life right. that you never had an opportunity to buy 32 years ago. <laughs> it's just, I wonder, if, I wonder if you six guys would like one of these. So we've gone, cool. To cover the nation on a tight touring schedule meant early starts, long travel days, and parties every other night. And the artists and crew have been hit with a mystery flu that swept through the tour and taken its toll on all but the luckiest. I already came on this tour with the flu. So you uh, no, I may have started, I don't think so, but anyway, I think we, everyone's blaming Diner at the moment, so we'll just keep it that way. <laughs> Blame an artist. Uh, everyone's doing it tough, it's been a pretty tight schedule, and uh, there's a lot of old people out here to get sick from. I got really sick in Wollongong, Wollongong and Newcastle, and, uh, and it's really hard because it's a long show. You're talking four hours and uh, you're talking, you know, it's quite loud and, and lots of action. And when one person's sick, it's bad enough, but when everyone else starts getting sick, tensions rise, bump-ins get harder, you have screaming, shouting, a few punch-ups. It has been very difficult with, we've, you know, we've got a really virulent flu strain going through the company and that's been really difficult for us. Sometimes on tour, the smallest things can cause the biggest problems. 35 acts, 60 musicians, 40 road crew, one ironing board. Something's got to give, because now Max has got it and I can't do my thing, and you know, you guys need that service. Who's going to carry it? It won't be in my cases. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely, I do. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm All right, I'll do it. I'll do We have a lady on our tour who's a wardrobe lady, Kath Heron, and she's, she's worked with the Rolling Stones for over a year, 
and she said even when they're doing their hectic schedules they never do any more than 18 days straight without a day off well she calculated that we're doing near 40 days straight without a day off now a travel day and a setup day is not a day off a travel day is not a setup day it should be a travel day only <coughs> but they've been incorporating the two of them so everyone's a little bit whingy about stuff like that as the tour neared completion the ABC decided that the Sydney show would be filmed for a special edition DVD. And when a TV production crew get involved, it means things are going to change. I'll never forget, um, we get to Sydney and of course by this time the, the caravan is rolling and the ABC decide the filming is going to be bigger than Ben Hur. I walked into the Sydney Entertainment Centre, it was probably fairly late in the day. And I walk in and there's fucking cameras everywhere. And there's this huge fucking crane right in the middle of the ground in the uh, in the most, And I freaked out. I just, I could see all these people coming in and, and just shit themselves because there was a camera up their ear and a camera, you know, staring down their throat. And to get to those seats, you had to bend over to duck under some fucking crane. So I went out the back and exploded. That fucking big crane's a joke. It's a fucking joke. If I didn't know it was going to be like that, I would have said no. Welcome to the It's fucked. What? We're going to have so many fucking complaints. It's unbelievable. The fucking vibe in that room is going to be a piece of shit with that half of the fucking floor missing. It's a fucking joke. I've never seen it in 35 fucking years at a concert have I seen that. Really? Yes! So get out, Mara. Fucking disaster. I would have rather had a fucking railway line in front of the stage. That's a disaster. It was nothing like that, I can assure you. Nothing like that. You hardly knew they were in the fucking room. Of course, it didn't make any difference. Nothing got moved. So we were very careful when the audience came in that we made them feel a big part of the filming, <laughs> which they were. But tonight, as you know, we're, we're filming tonight. We're videoing tonight. Because they're going to make a picture of this on DVD. And the two shows we filmed were magnificent. And, you know, when I actually sat down later and, and watched the, the rushes of what we had, it really came home to me just what we'd done, you know, what we'd achieved. And it was a very, very special feeling. The Sydney show also marked the return to the stage of original Joy Boy, fellow Long Way to the Top producer and Australian promoting icon Kevin Jacobson. With Kevin on piano, younger brother Keith on bass and Cole out front, it had been 40 years since these Australian rock and roll pioneers had hit the stage together. And Kev still got it after all these years. We should do one 20 years from now. <laughs> Where will we park our walking frames? Those people, I know. <laughs> Cole, Cole's a treat. He's a classic. He's like, he's, the, he's, our, he's our MC. Whether he's on stage all night or not, he's still our MC, I, I, I feel. Much of the footage seen behind the scenes was shot by one of the artists. John Paul Young decided way back when the Long Way to the Top tour was announced that he'd buy a video camera and carry it with him always. And video everything he did. I'm going to go out and buy a video camera because, I mean, I don't think this is ever going to happen again. You know, you're going to get some footage that, you know, will be absolutely unique yeah. and some that nobody's allowed to see. Can I actually have that tape for the documentary? No. You can't have that work and hippie music in here for fuck's sake. I hope you don't mind if we shut the fucking door. I get no respect. I know. <laughs> What's wrong with the way I look? The way I screw my mind. Standing backstage, nervous. Watching uh, the musicians get prepared for the onslaught.
sure the audience. As you can see, is, a little yeah. lubrication doesn't it's go as far. It's all it's warming up. And uh, <laughs> so, some of them are so old they're dead. <laughs> Bloody camera, there's that camera again. I'm gonna give you something to photograph in a minute. <laughs> Fucking camera. This is, this is... If you wanna take one night stand! I'm ready now. Of all the acts on the tour, one stood apart from the rest. And for one very good reason. Volume. Probably Billy Thorpe, because he's just so bloody loud. <laughs> Are we talking volume here or are we talking ego on stage and they're both the same person? <laughs> we just wait for the plug to come. Pretty good in the coal set that. That's cold to a sense of humour. He's sick. He's implying I'm loud. It was loud, yeah, I suppose it was loud. Um, the, the Aztecs were a loud band. The music that the, the, the second Aztecs, not the first Aztecs, although the first Aztecs were quite loud for their time. Um, there's something that comes out of playing music uh, loud. We're gonna tell you about a new boom. No Billy Thorpe, he's Billy Thorpe and he's gonna have more fucking amps than anybody else, he's gonna be louder than anybody else and he's gonna play fucking longer than anyone else. So you just, you live with it, that's what he is. That's why he's the biggest star and, and still a big star in the contemporary world of Australian music. Uh, as I said to Chuggy, I said, if you want the Sombre Aztecs, then you got to slow, you, then I'll give you the Sombre Aztecs, but, you, but I don't want anybody telling me it's too fucking loud, you know, because that's who we were and, uh, Anyway, everybody got used to it after a while. Except for Carl, <laughs> his still, ears are still ringing, I think. <laughs> it's because I miss you, thoughts of you come back to me. Ooh. Do what you want to do, be what you want to be, yeah. While Glenn Wheatley, bass player for the Master's Apprentices, couldn't always be available for the show, a suitably named understudy was found and very quickly became part of the band. I've done uh, only part of the tour. I've, I've been a bit busy with, with uh, putting on John Farnham shows and uh, etc. So I've been ably subbed by my 18-year-old son, Tim, who's basically done most of the work for me. And uh, I must say he's done a very, very good job too. So we're doing a tag team at the moment. Uh, Tim did last night at the Sydney Entertainment Centre here and I'm doing tonight. He'll do tomorrow, then I'll do I'll do the last night. So, you know, we're having fun. It's quite nerve-wracking half the time. I don't know who to talk to, where to look. But, um, no, it's been great. What is it like uh, playing with these old rockers? Somewhat surreal, considering I've grown up with every single one of their CDs and do all their songs, used to jam in my room to all their old stuff. And, um... Now to be on the same stage and chilling in the same dressing room as half of them is quite, um, quite an amazing feeling, actually. You spent most of the first few shows hanging to the side of the stage when you played. Uh, the last yeah. few nights you've been dancing around and getting into it. What's changed? And I don't know. I feel a lot more comfortable up there on stage now. Um, originally it was just kind of um, didn't quite feel part of the band, didn't know how the crowd would react or warm to me. But... Um, no, everything's been quite good, everything's been quite positive so far, so I think I kind of get into it a bit more now. We've been saying that um, when Glenn's not with us, we, uh, we, we gain an edge. <laughs> <laughs> he's also getting to the point where he sits around the old man and says, Now, Dad, you're better off start at the F sharp, slide up to the D, turn around, get a bit of sustain on the app, and I'm going, Hang on, I recorded this. <laughs> Thank you.
What the audience probably doesn't realise is that, um, unlike any other shows, uh, ensemble shows, uh, 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 they haven't, there's never been a show like this anywhere in the world, to my knowledge, but on any other ensemble shows, there's usually one backing band, or at the least one set of equipment that everybody uses. Um, if you look at the video, you'll see that everybody's using their own gear. Every time the Revolve comes around, except for the house band, which also had to be set up every time it revolved, um, there was a setup going on backstage while there was a band on stage. I think there was something like 20 different, 25 different changes of gear. Um, it was, um, it was quite a, a surgical procedure. I mean, and it was down to the wire, you know, down to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then <laughs> around we went, you know. Uh, but it was great because we, you get into a swing with it and, uh, and the crew were just so, were just so fantastic. And uh, they were also, when they did a setup, they were testing mics backstage with that setup, that's a, uh, the, and that setup is a kit of drums, full set of amplifiers, keyboards, microphones, fallback. Um, that were all being line tested to the front of house B desk or A desk while there was another act on front, so it's all being done like this. It was uh, it was magic. To show appreciation to the hard-working crew, the producers held the first Golden Sausage Roll Awards. As the saying goes, it's a long way to the shop if you want a sausage roll. I really want to thank John Pope and Skullman and all the crew. And that's the real reason we're here right now. And there's 40 crew on this tour. And without them, we wouldn't have been able to do it. We've been rolling out of towns, rolling into the next town, and they've been setting up in 18 hours. The show is amazing. We've blown 130,000 people away, and we couldn't have done it without them. Amanda and I then thought about things, and we brought on Ted Robinson. Ted, we couldn't have done it without you. I would have liked to have shoved that 70-foot crane up your ass yesterday, but, but thank you, mate. Couldn't have done it without him. He's, and you all fucking drive him crazy, I've got to tell you. John Pope, ladies and gentlemen. Jeff Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Wheat. The Skull Man. And I'm very proud of my son, Nicholas Chuck. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Greg Rossman. Ladies and gentlemen, Scrooge Manager. A true legend of Australian rock and roll. basically a 24-hour party that was interrupted by a show <laughs> three hours every night. <laughs> Keep in mind there was like something like 15 or 20 piano players on the show. There was God knows how many, you know, singers and guitar players, and there's a piano in every bar. So there were sing-alongs with uh, like Cole Joy can play every song ever written with three fingers, with uh, you, know, you know, one finger here and three chords here. He could play every song ever written, and know the words. Uh, amazing, amazing guy. Uh, so it would always be Cole would be the first one, and then Brian Cat would join him, and then somebody else, and Pig would get up, Warren Morgan from the Aztecs would get up, and somebody else would get up. Uh, so you'd end up in the middle of a Hilton where there were also regular punters staying. Um, and 150 maniacs, um, a, a concert, an impromptu concert. But, uh... well, I awoke me, I was mistaken. Oh, no. And I hung my head and... I remember they wouldn't let us use the piano in, um, 
in Adelaide because we might scratch it. So Col and I offered to buy it and put it on our room service. <laughs> And they relented. And the party hard older rockers certainly impressed the younger members of the team. Just to watch the goings on of, of how, you know, rock, rock and roll is um, of an older generation carry on. Um, as far as, as getting up on stage and, and kicking it hard after partying night after night after night and well into the wee hours of the morning. I just, I have no idea how they do it, but I think they just stay one drink ahead of a hangover. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> I don't know how they get back on stage. Yeah, I'm actually surprised how much they are part of it. <laughs> no, I can't keep up with them, I <laughs> And how old are we? <laughs> well, they all think they're 21. You know, it's, you've got to sneak out of the bar at 2 a.m. or you're there till dawn, you know. Oh. fitting that we'd finish in Melbourne um, so you know we were quite nervous about we'd been on the road you know for 20 odd shows and we'd become one big family so there was a lot of emotion involved and obviously uh, everybody was worried about what was going to happen on stage being the last show and um, so many so many people being in a good position to pull stunts and cause problems and you know there was there was some rivalry out there and there were a couple of people wanted to get even with so and so for playing too long one night or something like that you know so there was there were a lot of talking going on and basically we get down to the show we do the show and Cole's first up. Right at the end they all held up placards Tangy, nine out of ten Tangy. the whole front row right oh, oh, nine out of ten oh, no. nine out of ten ten out of ten I can hear words of encouragement. Get off, get off, he was calling. Well, I had to do it loud. <laughs> <laughs> they could hear you down the fucking cricket ground. Who gave the scorecard? <laughs> Tony Barber. Tony Barber. Are they the real audience? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Both sides. He'd be battered on both sides. Who did I give scores to on the first night? Me. <laughs> How'd you go? Like Bloody my... terrible. You give me a six. Oh, we gave him six. <coughs> they were bribed, those people. Some people gave you 11 out of 10. I know. I know. I've never got that many in my life. And that was the start of quite a long night. It was just ridiculous what went on. <laughs> Clap your hands, everybody. Sharon! 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 <laughs> and the priest of fucking darkness! And this is the wrong fucking gig! Sharon! It's J.P. Osborne. <laughs> oh, what did you tell us? That's good. The show band, the producer. Still are the bad boys of rock and roll, I hope. <laughs> if we're not, well, there's something wrong somewhere. I don't know about troublemakers. There's uh, there's always real f pranksters. We've got Bluey, Bluey and Cole from from um, the Aztecs are real the real pranksters. They're screams. It's a pretty sedate tour, in keeping with our age. I hate to say it, but it's true. It's pretty sedate. One of the show-stopping pieces of the show was uh, when the dancers put on these yellow, fluffy, bird-type outfits and danced in Lovers in the Air. Well, they got me and they put the bra on and the, the wings and the headdress and I danced across the stage during John Paul Young, blowing kisses and everything. And, of course, Squeak, never being slow to come forward, turns the chorus into Chuggies in the Air. Chuggies in the Air! guy has left his mark, or his stain, should I say, <laughs> on every spot 
on this continent. He's famous for his Dance of the Flames, which involves rolling up newspaper and setting it alight. He, in an overzealous moment, used Bruce paper once and set his ass at half a hotel on fire. Mr. John Louis Watson. Here. Well, Bluey, uh, on the bow, dropped his trousers. We didn't think he'd do it, but he really did it. We're proud of him. What a guy. My hero. <laughs> Don't know what happened. I was just standing there and off I came. Diet must be working. I apologise to everyone in Melbourne and on the show because it definitely wasn't, you know, meant to be. I had to get Normie Rowe. I mean, it was just, it had to be done. <laughs> we, were, we were rivals um, in the 60s, and um, that were, it was the perfect opportunity. There's usually this scantily dra dressed dancer with, you know, the great body and everything doing this silhouette dance that is, uh, on the screen. And she was replaced halfway through the song by Gil Matthews uh, and uh, some accomplice in doing one of those silhouette doctors, uh, the removal of things from various orifices of the body. Everybody's laughing. I swear. On the brunt of and the you joke. You can't see anything. And the poor girl who'd only done it last night and tonight was very upset. And Gil, you, you should know better, <laughs> you prick. It's good to see all the, the, the uh, familiar faces doing it and still doing it real good. You know? Yeah. you know, it's just sort of like yesterday, all of a sudden we're all back together again. It has to be documented, it has to be there. And once you get with this, this gang, I mean, they're a good bunch of people. Uh, there's no, there's no snotty nose in among this lot, uh, and if there was, I don't think they'd last very long, especially on this tour. The television show created a milestone in its own right, and I think to be uh, that the concept of taking it on the road, uh, I think was a was a, a, an extraordinary idea. Uh, I don't think anybody thought it was going to be as successful as what it was at the time, and uh, I think we've proved to a lot of people that we can still do it and still have a good time. A bit like a high school reunion, you know, there's a lot of love in the room and all that sort of stuff. You know, you can get a bit of sentimental about it, it's good fun. Um, you know, we're not ashamed of that at all. Probably a few tears at the end. And the production of values on the show is equal to, you know, any great show. You two, Stones, the same sort of money, investment, and time and energy and art and talent and design has gone into the show. And, and it's a pleasure to be on. Just, if you don't do anything else in your life, it's a nice thing to finish with. We actually have created something that will live long past us is just a fantastic feeling for me and I know that Kevin Jacobson, Amber, Amanda, Billy, uh, our American partner Jack Utsik um, all feel the same way that we, we actually went out there, uh, the promoters Kevin, Jack and I put our nuts on the line and it paid off and the mo it's just, it was Australian music paying off and uh, I'm very proud to have been part of it. Now, this is the last show. It's happy and it's sad. This is something that I sat down with Michael Chug. He's the guy that ran on with the feathers earlier. And Amanda Pellman and Ted Robinson, who directed the TV show that you'll see at the end of the year. This has been... I 
like I speak. It's been the best fucking thing I've ever done. As the finale of the last show approached and the artist left the long way to the top stage for the last time, mixed emotions could be seen on their faces as they stood side stage. The history-making musical adventure they'd taken together was coming to an end. Let's get some guitar players on here! Really, we've um, kind of, you know, really got to know each other pretty well now. There's a lot of people I haven't met that were on the on the show. Exhilarating, exciting, but very, very sad. Not to be missed and never to be forgotten. It was fantastic. Thank you very much, Mr. Chuck. It's been a beautiful uh, tour. Funny word, I know, but it feels so full of love to me. Um, I think we all genuinely like each other, and in most cases, we love each other. So. What a lovely time. The experience of my life was wonderful. It's just amazing to hook up with all the guys that I started out with, you know, like 90 guys that if you had asked me a week ago before the tour started, would I ever see these guys again, I probably would have said my chances are zilch of seeing everyone, but to get to hang out with them for a month and they're still playing music to me, I, I'm a happy man. and crew of long way to the top. We like to thank all the crew. 
And the guys at the sound desk. And the 50 guys that have been working backstage all night that you haven't seen. Come on. Come on. Four and a half weeks, 18 concerts, and 140,000 people. Australia 